everyone. My name is Charmaine Lindsay, and I'm a board member of the Ireland Park Foundation, which is sponsoring tonight's event. Welcome to the launch of the Irish Famine Migrant Stories in Ontario Virtual Exhibit. This is the second in the Foundation's online monthly Canada-Ireland Conversations. In a few minutes, I will introduce tonight's four very distinguished panelists who will be discussing the fascinating content of this virtual exhibit. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so audio and video will be turned off for all but the panelists. The chat function will also be disabled, but you are welcome to submit questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If time permits, at the end of the discussion, I will try to submit some questions from the audience to the panelists. You can also use the Q&A function to feature to tell us and about any technical issues you are having, and we'll try to resolve those. And now for the introduction of our panelists. Our first panelist is Robert Kearns. Robert G. Kearns is president and founder of Kearns Insurance Corporation and Kearns Investment Corporation. He is also a founding partner of Kearns Edgewater Financial Services, Inc. There he is, hi Robert. He's the chair and founder of the Ireland Park Foundation and our fearless leader. In a few minutes, I will call upon Robert to make an important announcement about the foundation. But first, a little bit more about him. Originally from Dublin, he immigrated to Canada in 1979 and has been actively involved in Irish Canadian business and cultural relations since that time. He has served on the boards of the Ireland Fund of Canada acting as chair from 1989 to 1992, the America Ireland Fund, and is the founding director of the Canada Ireland Chamber of Commerce. In 1997, he began work to start the Ireland Park Foundation, which culminated in the opening of Ireland Park on Toronto's waterfront in June of 2007. In 2008, he and his brother, Jonathan Kearns of Kearns Mancini Architects, were named Joint Irish Persons of the Year for their roles in designing and creating Ireland Park. Other awards include an honorary fellowship from St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. And, and in 2016, Robert was the Canadian recipient of the Irish Presidential Distinguished Service of, for the Irish Abroad. Welcome, Robert. Our second panelist is Dr. Jason King. Where's Jason? There he is. Hello, Jason. Jason is the academic coordinator of the Irish Heritage Trust and the National Famine Museum in Strokestown Park, Ireland. He is also a historical advisor to this foundation. He is member of the Government of Ireland's National Famine Commemoration Committee and the coordinator of the Great Famine Voices Roadshow, which collects video family stories from descendants of Irish famine immigrants. Watch our website for news of this project in the late spring and early summer. And finally, Jason is the curator of the Irish Famine Migrant Stories in Ontario virtual exhibit that we'll be discussing this evening. He will also moderate that discussion. Welcome, Jason. Our third panelist is Mark McGowan. There's Mark, hi. Mark is a professor of history at the University of Toronto and the principal and vice president of the University of St. Michael's College, U of T. He has served in various administrative capacities in the university, but is better known for his work in the social, religious and migration history of Canada and Ireland. He's the author of numerous award-winning books and article on the history of the Catholic Church and the Irish, and was a primary contributor to the Ireland-Canada co-production of Death or Canada, a film loosely based on his book of the same name on the Irish famine migration to Toronto in 1847. 
He is the recipient of four university teaching awards and is currently working on two book projects, one on the Irish famine orphans in Canada and the other on the assisted migration scheme from Strokestown County Roscommon to Canada during the Great Irish Famine. Welcome, Mark. And our fourth and five final panelist is Laura Smith. Laura J. Smith, PhD, is a historian of the Irish in 19th century Ontario. She also is a historical consultant for our foundation. She's written and presented academic papers on the migration and settlement of Irish Catholics in Ontario in the 1820s and 30s. Irish famine migration to Ontario in 1847, including accounts of the arrival of famine immigrants in the Hamilton area, and the routes that these immigrants took from Ontario ports into the interior of the province. She has conducted research into the medical, medical response in Toronto to the famine immigrants that arrived here in 1847, and on the life and contribution of Dr. George Robert Crisset in the preparation for the creation and opening of Crisset Park by our foundation later this year. Welcome to you all, and I will now turn it over to Robert Cairns to bring greetings from the board and make an important announcement about the foundation. Thank you very much, Charmaine, and a very happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone both here and in Ireland. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you this evening. We've had a very interesting journey with Ireland Park Foundation. Uh, of course, 1997 was the 150th anniversary year of the Great Famine. And uh, in fact, it, my involvement with it goes back even a few years before that, as I had the great pleasure and honor to meet uh, Mrs. Norma Smurfett, who commissioned the sculptures in Dublin in 1995. And uh, so when they were allocated to Dublin, to the waterfront in Dublin, I asked Rowan Gillespie if we could find a waterfront location in Toronto, would he sculpt a set for a group for Toronto depicting a rival? So that got underway in 95, 96, and in 1997, we established a volunteer board. And then the uh, foundation was incorporated in May 2000, and we got charitable status in 2004 and Ireland Park opened in June of uh, 2007. Well, there was an extraordinary response to the opening of Ireland Park, the uncovery of uh, the recovery and discovery of very important parts of the history of the city and the Irish contribution to it and involvement in it. And uh, both Mark McGowan and Michael Chard and Neil Sands and uh, Laura Smith have contributed a, an abundance of information and as has uh, Nancy Mallett and then Jason King's work with diaries. So from a position 25 years ago of knowing very little really about what transpired in this city, we now know a lot more. And that really made it imperative that beyond Ireland Park, we should also uh, honor and recognize the local citizens of the city who volunteered and came forward to respond to the arrival of 38,560 men, women, and children on the waterfront of this city when the population was just 20,000. I mean, that's a, still to this day a remarkable story. And uh, later on in our discussion this evening, we'll go into more detail about loss of life and so on. But it's incredibly important that while Ireland Park acknowledges and, and uh, commemorates the arrival of these individuals, it seems appropriate as well that we honor and commemorate those who lost their lives helping them. And really in that context, um, we've now moved on beyond Grisette Park, which will open in the summer of this year, all, all being well with the pandemic, uh, to also um, gain access to a building that uh, certainly I have and our board have coveted since 2000, because it's the only uh, standalone building, uh, heritage designated building, on the, Toronto, on the Toronto waterfront in immediate proximity to Ireland Park. So it's a great thrill to be able to say that we now have, have custody of that building and uh, we have raised a significant amount of money to restore it and conserve it and repurpose it. And that will open in 
uh, the spring summer of 2022. So all this to say that Ireland Park Foundation speaks to one aspect of our journey. And insofar as we have other aspects of the journey now to celebrate, including Grissette Park and now the building and other academic papers and other research to undertake in the future, and perhaps explore other opportunities and other footprints of people from Ireland and other parts of Canada, a name change seemed appropriate. And therefore our board are very happy to bring forward the, the, the decision that the Ireland Park Foundation now be known as the Canada Ireland Foundation. And again, it addresses the entirety of the island of Ireland, and of course, also the entirety of Canada. We are a Canadian charitable foundation, so it's appropriate that Canada be the first word in the name. So the only word that's been dropped is park, and the word that's been added is Canada. So we think it's a very good solution, and uh, I think it'll uh, more readily and accurately reflect the work that the foundation is embarked upon. So Jason, I think you were going to take over from me at this point. Yes, thank you, Robert. I'd like to begin by wishing everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day as well. And I'm going to start by sharing screen so that you can all see the Irish famine migrant stories in Ontario virtual exhibit. So Robert, nod your head that you do see the exhibit on screen. Very good. Yes, Very I good. do indeed, yes. So I want to begin by acknowledging the funder of the Irish Famine Migrant Stories in Ontario virtual exhibit, which is the Digital Museum of Canada. The online exhibit was developed with the support of digital, the Digital Museums of Canada investment program under its uh, large project investment scheme. And Digital Museums Canada is managed by the Canadian Museum of History with the financial support of the Government of Canada. Uh, and I'd also like to point out the, uh, from the beginning that this exhibit is available both in English and in French. You can see Francais there, the top center of your screen. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge the work of uh, our program officer, Constance Nobel, who we've been working with for several years in developing this exhibit, uh, as well as some members of the project team, Ryan Tate and uh, Ian Clark in particular, who did superb work in the technical development of the, of the exhibit and our translator, Dr. Simon Jolivet. Now, I'm going to take you on a very brief tour of the exhibit before we start our panel discussion. We're here on our homepage. You can see the, uh, the URL or the link is irishfaminestories.ca, irishfaminestories.ca begins with a video with Robert, but I'm going to take us through the six sections of the exhibit very, very briefly. The first theme of the exhibit is called Sacrifice, Toronto's Dr. Grisset, and it focuses on Dr. Grisset and his emergency responses to the arrival of the famine Irish as, wit as witnessed from the perspective of their Canadian caregivers. The second exhibit theme is Bearing Witness, Stephen Devere's Famine Diary, 1847-1848. And this makes available for the first time the remarkable, unpublished, very evocative eyewitness accounts of Stephen Devere, who traveled to Canada in 1847-1848, who traveled in the steerage of a coffin ship to bear witness to the suffering of famine emigrants, who published in the House of Lords uh, colonization papers, the most famous and most influential account of the famine migration, uh, an account that's widely known, but what is not well known is that he kept these remarkable red leather bound diaries that you see on your screen, now housed in the manuscripts department of Trinity College Dublin, which contain very powerful, very evocative descriptions of everything he witnessed while he was in Canada. And I'm very briefly going to look at just one of them now. We move through the Stephen Devere section. You will see he in fact wrote two diaries in 1847, 1848. They've been fully digitized, made fully accessible in the exhibit as well as key passages. And I want to concentrate on just one. October the 1st, 1847, a very inauspicious day in Ontario history. We have 
With us this evening, Professor Mark McGowan, the biographer of the Bishop of Toronto, Michael Power, who died on Friday, October the 1st, 1847, a day in which Stephen Devere happened to be in Toronto and Stephen Devere recorded a very moving obituary only for himself in his journal. You see on the right-hand side of the screen, the actual digitized journal itself, its transcription on the left, and I'll just read this one entry from the diary uh, for this section. Morning service, Reverend Michael Power, ED Catholic Bishop of Toronto died this morning. He was a man of great generosity and nobleness, most kindly and charitable in a true and most extended kindly sense, a humble Christian. By his example, his justice, his unfailing attention to the duties of his high station, the strictness of his discipline. The page comes to an end, so we go to the next page. He brought into perfect order a diocese which he found almost entirely in anarchy. His death is attributable under providence to the noble and devoted zeal with which, since the illness of so many of his clergy, he has visited the beds of every sick and dying emigrant. He did not spare himself, but God had spared him a longer sojourn on earth. He was a man of no political party, of no religious bigotry. He was too strong-minded to be a bigot and too wise to be a partisan. He was therefore respected and beloved by men of all creeds and parties. May almighty God have mercy on his soul. And as I've said, Stephen Devere wrote this only for himself. It was never published. It was never made public. It sat there in the archives for over 150 years till we've made it available uh, in this digital exhibit. And the diary is full of very moving, very powerful passages like this one. We go back to our home screen. Our third section is called Traumatized Survivors in Niagara. This section follows a group of emigrants from the Strokestown estate of Major Dennis Mahan in County Roscommon, now home of the National Famine Museum where I work. And it follows them to the Niagara region of Ontario where two of them committed murder. This is one of Mark McGowan's areas of, special, uh, of research specialization as well. And uh, he features quite prominently in this section. The fourth section of the exhibit is called Kingston and Toronto's Famine Orphans, and it focuses in particular on the resilience of child migrants who lost their parents during the transatlantic voyage and their experiences in the Canadian fever sheds, and in particular uh, under the care of the Religious Hospital of Sisters in Kingston and the Toronto Widows and Orphans Asylum uh, in, in Toronto. Our fifth section is called Compassion and Struggle, Sister Briere in Bytown. It explores her story of female empowerment and independence and in caring for famine emigrants despite the many barriers that women faced in 19th century Canada. And the final exhibit section is called Remembering Family Stories. It brings together the living descendants of famine emigrants, such as Bridget Ann Tracy, Sarah Caveney, and Rose and Barney Murphy, who survived shipwrecks on board the Carracks and Hannah to start new lives in Canada and Ontario. And their successors share in this section precious family heirlooms, mementos, and memories. So that's our whistle stop, very brief tour of the, uh, the different sections of the Irish famine migrant stories in Ontario virtual exhibit. I want to now start our panel discussion and I want to start with you, Robert, uh, with a question about our first section, Sacrifice, Toronto's Dr. Grissette. And Robert, could you tell us a little bit about uh, who Dr. Grissette was? What was the sacrifice that he made that uh, both has inspired this exhibit in many respects and of course the opening of Grissette Park in the summer? Can you tell us a little bit about the man? Well, thank you, Jason. Um, Dr. Grissette uh, is an extraordinary individual, and I remember clearly receiving that phone call from you, Mark, one day back in 2005 or 2006 to tell me that you had uncovered the story of Dr. Grissette and how he had volunteered and lost his life in the fever sheds helping Irish migrants. And it resonated uh, certainly with me at the time because Dr. Grissett came from an Anglo-Irish establishment family. And we don't think so much of people's religious background today, but in the early 19, 1840s of Toronto, or you know, in that time frame, it was, it was important. And uh, there was a great deal of uh, um, sectarianism here and in Ireland and other parts of the world. So he chose to 
ignore sectarian boundaries and to put his life at risk to come to the aid of um, men, women, and children. Uh, in many cases, he'd, he wouldn't have known what religion they were. They were just fellow human beings who were in terrible distress. Now, his background for this action comes from the fact that he was one of six boys uh, born to um, uh, Henry Grisset in, in Portugal in 1811. So his father served at Woolsey in the Peninsular Wars as a surgeon, which was a pretty grisly occupation when dealing with battlefield casualties from musket balls and cannon. And so um, the regiment was posted to, I believe, Quebec City in 1813. So that would have been during the War of 1812. And um, so the family settled in Canada because his father, I think, had reached the end of his service with the, with the British Army. And he moved to Montreal and uh, uh, George Robert trained under his father. Uh, it seems very effectively because he passed all of, all of his exams. And interestingly, Charmaine, our host this evening uh, and board member, uh, located Dr. Grisset Sr.'s medical uh, briefcase which um, almost looks like a, <laughs> something that you would have at the Tower of London. But uh, nonetheless, I, I don't know if it's on the site, Jason. Is it uh, anywhere, uh, Dr. Grisset's uh, medical valise, is it? I, no, I, I don't believe it is, Robert. Okay, all right. Well, you know, we'll have it on our website at some point between now and the opening of the park. But let me just hasten to say that he, uh, his first position was in, in Amherstburg in southern Ontario, and uh, he was very popular down there because the people in the neighborhood, when he indicated he was going to come back to Toronto, took up a collection for him to stay. And he did stay for an additional year, but then came back to Toronto because he wasn't well. And he uh, lived in his brother's residence on Adelaide Street at church. Uh, his brother Henry was the, uh, the dean or rector of um, St. James Cathedral. He later became dean. And so... Um, as a young physician, he was, he had obviously a personality of uh, empathy and caring to others. He was one of the founders of the Hospital for the Indigent Sick and the uh, Toronto Dispensary. I mean, he was founder of the Toronto Dispensary, but he also volunteered in the, um, uh, in the Hospital for the Indigent Sick and for the House of, in, in the House of Industry and secretary of the Ontario Bible Society. So he begins to lobby through his brother for the position in the hospital uh, early in June. And uh, we know the first steamer arrived in Toronto on the 8th of June. And by the 18th of June, he was appointed as the, um, as the attending surgeon in the emigrant hospital. And within less than a month, he succumbed to typhus and died on the 16th of July. And I believe uh, Stephen Devere arrives the following day, the 17th of July, Jason, and I think in his diary, he mentions that the uh, surge, that the attending physician had lost his life the day before. But Dr. Grisset, I think, would have known that he ran a very high risk of losing his life. But he felt that it was more important to step forward and help be these people who were suffering uh, in a great degree and in a condition that had no cure. And we now understand that it's very likely that he wasn't paid for his service. And neither was Dr. Joseph Hamilton. So um, uh, Laura and I were talking about this earlier today. It seems, it seems to be the case that it was an honorary position and, uh, and they weren't paid for their work. So this is a, a very important individual in the humanitarian story of our city and the way we respond to migration. And that's why we think it's so important to celebrate his life and his sacrifice because it's such an example to everyone in this city and indeed in the province in Canada. Thank you, Robert. The, uh, both the exhibit and Grisset Park, of course, pay tribute to Dr. Grisset, but they also pay tribute to some of the, uh, the lesser known medical personnel, some of the lesser known frontline uh, workers and historical figures who's, uh, who were perhaps less prominent in the, uh, in the 1840s. Could you tell us about some of these other figures who are also being acknowledged in both the yes, exhibit and yes. Grisset Park? Um, well, uh, Edward McElderry was the triage officer and he was from Newry. Um, I know that Laura is going to talk a bit further about uh, uh, Edward McElderry, but he was recommended for the, for the hospital by, um, by, doc, by, um, by Bishop Power. And so he was down at the foot of uh, Reese's Street on Dr. Reese's Wharf. 
uh, meeting the uh, the emigrants as they got off the, uh, the, the 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 steamers from Hamilton, and so he would have directed those to uh, to the hospital if they showed evidence of uh, of typhus, and then others we now know he signed the. Uh, the uh, uh, Teamster dockets for their transportation out of the city to other parts of the province, which Laura has discovered in abundance at an archive in Ottawa, which haven't really seen the light of day since Edward McElderry put them in a in an attaché case uh, on one of those summer evenings on the on, down on the waterfront. So we know of the names, I think, of about eight or nine other individuals. Uh, the head nurse was Susan Bailey. Uh, she died towards the end of August. Uh, Anne Slocum, um, uh, Sarah Jane Sherwood, she was only 23, she was born in Ireland. Uh, Catherine Doherty uh, was uh, also born in Ireland. And then there were hospital orderlies, William Harrison, uh, Richard Jones, and John McNabb. So their names will be in Grissette Park, uh, uh, along with Sarah Duggan. Um, and really their names have been lost to memory since they died in that summer of 1847, and we think that uh, they should be restored to memory and they should be honoured for the sacrifice they made in pretty ghastly circumstances. Thank you, Robert. You, you mentioned at the beginning of our programme the, uh, the tremendous volume of migration in, in 1847. Almost twice as many people arrived in the city of Toronto as, as, as happened to live there. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the conditions that were encountered by Dr. Grissette and his fellow medical personnel in Toronto in the summer of 1847? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you know, your work on diaries, Jason, has been very significant. So the discovery of the Stephen de Vere diary, and he describes Edward McElderry reeling backwards when the, the hatches were cast off the, the, the decks of the steamers arriving from Kingston. I mean, if you're jammed below decks on the North Atlantic for 45 or 55 or 60 days, depending on the time of year, the weather, the winds, uh, without adequate sanitation, um, it, it would have been, you know, a very unsatisfactory situation. And so um, uh, hygiene was a big issue. And of course, people crammed together in close quarters uh, would have been a very convenient vector for lice which is the manner in which uh, typhus was spread. So I think the, the physical appearance and uh, the malodorous nature of uh, the migrants would have been uh, very alarming for the citizens of the city. The, uh, the volume of, of migrants was also gigantic. I mean, the population at the time of um, the War of 1812 of Toronto, I believe, was about 700. So by the time of the migrants' arrival, it was 20,000, and 38,560 arrived between the 8th of June and the end of that year. 100,000 overall came from Ireland to Canada at a time when I believe the population of the country was about a million and a half people. So it's on a scale without parallel in the modern context. And of course, it's still to this day the largest single loss of life to any one cause when expressed as a percentage of the population. So about 1,186 men, women, and children lost their lives, including local healthcare workers, according to Constable Townsend's report uh, in, in, in January, February of 1848. <clears throat> but that was still less, about 3% of those who arrived, still less than the 20% mortality on the Atlantic or upon or shortly upon arrival or after arrival at Grosse Isle, Montreal, Kingston, Whitby and Toronto and Hamilton. Thank you, Robert. When we talk about the, uh, the famine Irish who perished in, in Toronto, of course, Ireland Park pays tribute to them. You mentioned at the beginning of our program that Grissette Park will be opening uh, in the summer and Grissette mm -hmm. Park focuses more specifically as does this exhibit on, on their Canadian caregivers, people like uh, Dr. Grissette. Could you say a little bit about the differences between Ireland Park and Grissette Park and what, what can we look forward to in Grissette Park when it opens? Well, Grissette Park um, is very much an urban park. It's set on a streetscape. In fact, the, the horizontal plane of the park is the 1842 Keynes map of Toronto, and that's etched in black granite from Quebec. And rising from this surface 
to the sky are panels of, of glass, tempered glass with cheesecloth laminated inside. And these evoke the, um, the, the, the cheesecloth that was strung from the rafters of the fever sheds to give relief to the migrants suffering from, from flies and some modicum of privacy. Um, because it was a hot summer and the fever sheds were, you know, there was no air conditioning and we, we believe that uh, one side of the fever shed was completely open. So really they were just shelters from, from, uh, from sun and rain and wind. Um, so this is a place where one would happen upon uh, this park, uh, you know, without a long foresight. You would literally come around the corner and there it would be. Now in the evening, the, the panels of glass will be illuminated. So if one were standing on the north side of the street in 1847, looking south, I think that was Newgate Street at the time, uh, one would see the open-sided fever sheds and probably whale oil lamps inside and cheesecloth billowing gently uh, as the physicians and, 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 uh, and nurses went about caring for the patients. So in 2021, uh, when you stand on the north side of Adelaide Street and look south, after dusk, one will see these panels of cheesecloth suspended in the laminated glass, but illuminated from uh, lighting set in the ground, an LED lighting system set in the ground. So we think it's going to be quite, um, <clears throat> quite evocative and quite ghostly. Um, so it's a very different kind of commemoration. It's abstract, there's no sculptural forms. Black benches uh, will be evocative of cots there'll be an extensive written description of what took place in the emigrant hospital. Whereas in, in Ireland Park, in some respects, Ireland Park is a cemetery without bodies. And the only, the only script in Ireland Park is actually the names of those who lost their lives and who are engraved on the, on the 14 sculptural columns. Um, but obviously now with, with, with our new, new websites uh, for both parks and the facilities that will be afforded in the building, uh, we'll be able to tell a lot more about the story of, of the journey and the arrival. But uh, Grisset Park will be, we think, the first major public artistically inspired memorial to members of the medical profession, doctors, nurses, hospital orderlies, anywhere in North America that I'm aware of at the moment. Now, on Partridge Island and on Gros Isle, there are a ser series of urns in memory and honor of the doctors who lost their lives. But in, a, in, a, in an urban context, in an abstract artistic manner, we think this is without parallel. And so to open this park in the summer of 2021, in the middle of the greatest pandemic, certainly in our lifetime, uh, but certainly in 100 years, is very poignant. And I think it'll, it will cause people to pause and reflect. And for physicians, uh, many of whom you know, whenever I've spoken to physicians about it, they're, they're, they're quite taken aback because we can all understand soldiers and airmen and sailors being honored for uh, risking their lives in defending the country, but we really have not addressed the, the courage of um, doctors and nurses who don their white, their white coats and, uh, and scrubs in, in hospitals and clinics across Canada and elsewhere in the world to save lives and, and, and uh, keep people safe so it's there is a uh, there is a, a timing serendipity thank you robert i'm going to move on to laura now but you did point out the uh the poignancy and the irony both of this virtual exhibit and grisette park being uh, unveiled and opened uh in the midst of our our own pandemic these of course uh, are both vehicles to pay tribute to those caregivers in the past who made the ultimate sacrifice, but our frontline workers, our medical personnel today, in many ways are experiencing that same sense of uh, uh, anxiety, uncertainty, and 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 and, and, and confronting the, the unknown with with this with this new uh, this new pandemic of COVID nineteen, which we're still very much in the midst of. So thank you, Robert, Laura. Uh, it's important to point out that the. Uh, this virtual exhibit tells the stories of the famine Irish in Toronto, but also in lots of other parts of Ontario as well, including Hamilton, including Burlington Heights, which is an area that you know very well, so an area that your research specializes in. Can you tell us a little bit about the significance of the Burlington Heights burial ground uh, on the outskirts of Hamilton? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bur Burlington Heights, um, 
for those of you who are familiar or those who aren't familiar, is a very, um, it's a fantastic um, site in Hamilton. Um, it's sort of on the outskirts between Hamilton and Burlington. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a glacial, uh, I'm not going to pretend that I understand geology, but it's a very significant geological feature um, and has had arche archaeological, historical and environmental significance to, and it continues to this day. But as Jason um, alluded to, uh, it's important for the history of the Irish in Canada because it is the site of a mass grave. Um, and so the majority, we think, of, um, of the Irish who died in the city of Hamilton's immigrant hospital were buried in that mass grave. Um, and so there's a couple of reasons why they ended up there. Um, so, uh, you know, as I said, uh, uh, it, Burlington Heights sits at the end of Lake Ontario. So for those of you who aren't from Canada, um, or at least aren't from Ontario, you can visualize Lake Ontario is a big oval. Hamilton's at the western end of that. Um, and then within at the end of Hamilton, there's, there's a harbor and then beyond there's a marsh. And Burlington Heights is that strip of land that's between the marsh and the harbor. Um, and so it was always a, a significant um, overwintering site for the Mississauga um, and um, until uh, the, the War of 1812, which is when the British military took it over um, as a, an encampment. Um, where it was where they launched their, um, their attempt to retake the Niagara Peninsula in 1813. Um, and so as a result, um, their presence there resulted in some infrastructure. Um, they built barracks, they had um, a rudimentary hospital, and they had a cemetery. And that's really important because um, when Hamilton, the city, um, or the town rather, um, was established in the 1830s, it didn't have medical infrastructure, it didn't have um, cemeteries. And so when the cholera epidemics of the 1830s um, came about, the military um, uh, set the military cemetery was repurposed as a cholera burying ground. Um, and so fast forward to 1847, um, it's still sort of the edge of town. It's the isolated place where it makes sense to send potentially diseased um, bodies, uh, strangers. Um, that's, and so as a result, um, at least in 1847, by then we did have a uh, two, there was a Roman Catholic church, St. Mary's and an Anglican church, um, Christ Church. They both had cemeteries on site, but interestingly, the records show only six immigrants were buried at the, at the Catholic cemetery and 69 at the Anglican. And we know from the government records that at least 262, probably more people died in that immigrant hospital. And it's only because Reverend Edward Gordon, uh, my absolute favorite priest <laughs> for 19th century Ontario, who was an excellent record keeper, God bless him, he wrote at the end of the burial register, the bulk of the Irish immigrants who died this year were buried at the Burlington Heights. And that is the only um, record we have from that period to explain what happened to all those people. Um, and so they were, they were buried in that mass grave on Burlington Heights. Um, and so it, it's a really interesting place. There's a plaque there to this day. It was put there in 1926 um, by an, a concerned citizen who was horrified that a gravel pit was operating on the outskirts of the cemetery. And so he petitioned the federal government, who at the time owned, owned the land, to um, allow him to, to have the lease, or sorry, to lease the land to the city of Hamilton and have it protected. Um, and so he managed to get that gravel pit um, operation stopped and have the land uh, preserved. A plaque was put there in 1926. And, you know, ultimately it's sort of a, a, a quirk of history. It's, it, it stays, it's still there and it's still relatively isolated. It's surrounded by a very busy expressway and a very busy street, two access points into downtown Hamilton. And as a result, it's sort of isolated. It's this um, sort of idyllic island in a sea of traffic. And so um, ultimately its isolation was the cause, was, was why it was created and why that site was chosen. But the isolation is sort of what keeps that place persisting. So it's a pretty special place. Thank you, Laura. One of the features of this virtual exhibit is it uh, has interactive maps that trace the roots of famine Irish immigrants as they made their way through Canada West or Ontario. And I know, Laura, this is one of your uh, research specializations as well, tracking those immigrants on the move as they arrive and very rapidly move on to different places uh, during this period. Could you briefly tell us about um, the conditions they experienced, uh, these, these famine Irish immigrants, as they were making their way through Ontario in 1847? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's funny, Robert, you said that um, uh, Ireland Park is a graveyard without bodies, and, uh, and I keep going back to, the, um, to talking about, you know, we, we have to start to uncover the stories of those who survived, and, and those, that mobility is, is key to that. 
um, one of the one of the things that happened um, when immigrants arrived on the wharfs and the ports of Lake Ontario is they were met by a government agent, um, a provincial government agent to triage them, whether they needed help, whether they needed assistance, whether they needed shelter. Um, and they were given those things temporarily um, for a short period of time. But the main issue was if you were healthy, they wanted to move you on. Um, and so uh, they were given uh, transportation out of, out of Toronto, out of Hamilton, out of Port Hope, out of Kingston, all those cities. Um, and thankfully, because it was a government funded project, they left records. And uh, Robert re referred to these earlier, but um, we have the receipts, uh, literally, <laughs> of where, um, where people went, who they went with. Do they have baggage? It tells you how many carts of baggage went with these immigrants, where they were going, how many people were in their party. Um, and so we can start to trace um, their movements. Um, the, the immigrants that left Toronto, they went up Yonge Street. They went to Innisfil Township. They went to Holland Landing. They went to other communities on Lake Simcoe. Um, the people who left Hamilton, they went to Brantford um, and then on to London, or they went to the communities that are now Cam um, Cambridge, like Preston, uh, Preston and Galt, um, or they went to Guelph. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting to see um, uh, how they moved, and it, it, gives, it gives a lot of scope for the imagination on thinking about how the dispersal of immigrants um, from the wharf. Um, and even in their stories in those places like London and Brantford of people arriving in there. And, and so there's a record there of, um, of their arrival, um, you know, the sort of curious spectacle that these immigrants make in, in places that are nowhere near water. <laughs> um, and what ends up happening is they have to establish boards of health themselves. Um, they have to respond to the medical needs of these immigrants as well. And so you can trace the mobility of those immigrants through the province by the creation of boards of health as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really, uh, um, really interesting to start to think about. Um, we know, we know, um, we know for, for the most part, those who died, um, but these records are a really great way of, of telling us who, who lived. And, and I know Mark um, in his work and myself have, want to start to trace um, these immigrants and other records and find them in places, find them elsewhere in Ontario. Where did they end up? Or did they end up going on to the United States, which was often often the case? Thank you, Laura. You've, of course, worked very closely with Mark and with Robert in uh, uh, the creation of the, of the park, the creation of this exhibit as well. And you make the point that these migrants traveled uh, all over Ontario as they were as they were on the move. We're going to uh, turn now to our final panelist, uh, Professor Mark McGowan, whom uh, I've worked with extensively in creating this exhibit. And our final questions are going to really be a sort of whistle-stop tour of the remaining sections of the exhibit. We've covered only uh, the first and second sections so far. Uh, there's four others, so I have four questions for you, Mark, each of which will touch on one of the sections of the exhibit. And we're going to begin with section three, traumatized survivors in Niagara, which I pointed out at the beginning of our, our program uh, uh, today, tracks those 400 and, uh, 1,490 immigrants from the Strokestown Park Estate to the Niagara region of Canada West. Could you very briefly give us an overview of uh, this particular assisted emigration scheme, which I know you've, uh, you, you've, 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 you've done a great deal of research upon? Uh, either that's a hint about my windiness or it's, uh, it, it's a testament to the fact that we're, we're condensing years of research and, and the audience tonight should know that. I mean, uh, Jason literally has been on the move. I call him Spielberg King because uh, he and I have tracked ourselves across the province of Ontario, uh, collecting these stories and then uh, making these little vignettes that you'll see uh, on, on the site. So uh, yeah, so how, how do you condense that? Much of my work was supposed to end after the biography of Bishop Power. Then this guy called Robert Kearns got me interested in uh, doing a memorial. And what I think often historians don't want to do them and they want to do them properly. And I must say that Ireland Park was done properly. And then I thought I was going to give that up and do something else. And then I got dragged into a project in Ireland in Strokestown and the flag of County Roscommon is behind me here as a shameless plug for a great county in, in central Ireland and Connaught. That project was to try to track 1,490 assisted immigrants off Dennis Mann's estate in 1847. He had a, a large estate, uh, about 3,000 uh, acres in, in, in Strokestown that expanded uh, through family marriages, but he, uh, he created a, a very controversial assisted immigration scheme in 1847 uh, 
these, these migrants uh, basically uh, traveled along the Royal Canal, uh, 160 kilometers to Dublin, got on steamships where there were four chartered ships waiting for them to take them to Quebec. Um, they knew that they were going to Upper Canada, uh, and the tragedy of it is, is that uh, at least three of these ships weren't up to snuff. They would be the proverbial coffin ships, and about close to about 30% of these migrants never saw Quebec City. Either they died at sea or, or they died at Gracil. So, you know, picking up those strands, I mean, my task was to figure out what happened to these people, not only the dead, but to get a, a kind of a reading as to where this assistant uh, uh, this collection of migrants went, and I discovered some of the Niagara Peninsula. Naturally, a great place to go if you're looking for work. There are already people from Connaught there in uh, 1847 and from Cork. Um, in fact, they're the ones who are building and renovating uh, the Welland Canal and then the, building the second canal. So it's a natural magnet. And what we discover is that these Irish people begin to recreate life as they knew it in Ireland. And with recreating that life, they recreate some of the old hostilities. One man by the name of Thomas Brennan had lost his wife at Gros Isle and probably one child along the way. And we don't know the name of the child, but we know that he had two children and only a teenage daughter ended up on the Niagara. And in 1848, uh, he was cavorting with a family, the O'Connors, uh, Thomas or Patrick and Mary O'Connor. Uh, and, uh, and then Patrick and Mary O'Connor disappear. And then some school children. This reads like a Stephen King novel. So, I mean, I'm really condensing it here. This is the Coles Notes version. Um, two bodies are found in the Niagara Gorge. Uh, one is the is a half-naked body of Mary O'Connor. The other is the bludgeoned body of Patrick O'Connor. I mean, I couldn't write this. I mean, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. And then the constabulary in Toronto pick up this shady character by the name of Thomas Brennan. He's got a wad of money in his pocket and women's clothing that he's trying to sell on the street. Um, Needless to say, the Court of Assizes uh, tries Thomas Brennan for the murder of the two O'Connors. Uh, and the only eyewitness to all of this was their young son, John, who had been thrown over the escarpment but had escaped. Every testimony in that trial, okay, came from someone with a name from that estate. Um, so in a sense, in recreating the estate, they recreate a whole different storyline uh, that continues some of the battles in the old world. And so Part of this panel, uh, Jason, chronicles that story and it, and it links two big research projects that I've been working on, one in Canada and, and one in Ireland. So there's the uh, Harvey Keitel version very quickly of uh, a much more complicated story. Yes, very impressive indeed. And uh, I, I believe uh, one of the sort of sad uh, legacies of that that 1490 uh, immigrants migrating from from Roscommon is they they left many orphans in Canada I believe 60 orphans in Canada which is another one of your specialties. The fourth section of the exhibit focuses specifically, or you might be quibbling with the number, which should be fair enough. Um, the fifth, the fourth section of the exhibit focuses on the uh, orphans in Kingston and Toronto in particular. Uh, because time is brief, could you tell us uh, one? facet of the uh, the story of what happened to the the Irish orphans in Kingston on Christmas Eve in 1847 and could you tell us very briefly about the widows and orphans asylum in Toronto sure and I, I think to preface that as as I as I want to do we have to understand that most of the things that we know in in the public forum about Irish orphans is the Molly Johnson Heritage Minute which many of you will recall I mean, and I think it's important to note that what the research has discovered is that these these orphans were were not orphans in many cases. Uh, they had a, they were half orphans. Some of them, some of them, you know, uh, lost both parents. They weren't formally adopted because there was no legal adoption at the time. Many of them worked as indentured workers, um, and there was a survival of the fittest. The the many of the children died where where they landed. Many moved on, and Kingston was one of the spots. The religious hospitalers of St. Joseph were the uh, female religious order in Kingston at the time. They had just set up shop there. They had come from Montreal. Their Hotel Dieu wasn't even finished. And uh, on Christmas Eve, uh, 1847, uh, Father Angus MacDonald, who's one of the local priests, brings close to 70 orphans <laughs> to the sisters. Um, they're completely ill-equipped. Um, and they try to give them Christmas dinner, but they only have 10 sets of utensils and plates. So just imagine in your mind's eye, Christmas dinner is prepared and it's placed 
uh, on a bed frame on trestles uh, and uh, with, uh, with 10 spots with seven children lined up waiting for one to finish the meal clean the plate, and then the next one. Uh, and the sisters complain in, in their annals. Well, the sisters don't complain. They just regret that uh, they don't have enough beds, and the ones they do are bug and vermin infested. And this is uh, welcome to Christmas in Canada uh, to these Irish migrant children. In Toronto, it's an interesting ecumenical uh, effort, whereas we have numerous orphans, you know, who come out of the sheds that Robert has described, uh, who are left behind. Uh, and uh, actually, Protestants and Catholics in the city, uh, in very much the spirit that Michael Power tried to create ecumenically in the city, uh, create this, this uh, widows and orphans home. And in fact, it's the only place, and I've studied the orphans saga from St. John, New Brunswick, right through uh, to, uh, to, to Windsor. It's the only place because of municipal uh, laws that enabled Torontonians to do it is that there are actual contracts of indenture which have been preserved. So you can actually track an Irish child, okay, to a farmstead, okay, and then noting that so-and-so will apprentice for so many years and you will give them a cow and you will give them a bed and you will give them a hundred dollars cash when they complete uh, their work on the farm. And each one of these contracts is different. And, they, and these, these children are taken by priests to Catholic farms. The Protestant children are taken under the care of Protestants. And uh, what we have is a really interesting, unique case of at least uh, Catholics and Protestants, first of all, working together in a city that had been known as the Belfast of North America. Two, that there were actual terms and conditions so that these children weren't abused and taken advantage of by, by their placement areas. And, and I think three, we now have a historical record that we can refer to and reconstruct these lives of the children. And they go to Arthur, Ontario. They go to the Penetang. They go to Whitby. Uh, they go to the Holland Marsh area. Um, one, one priest in particular, Thaddeus Kerwin, actually makes sure that he is taking children to respectable farmers in Adula Township. And we actually have the names of all of those farmers uh, in, in his records. So um, there's another KTEL version of a very unique situation with regard to, to, to Irish migration. Thank you, Mark. Our fifth section of the exhibit is called Compassion and Struggle, Sister Briere in Bytown, now Ottawa. She too, of course, took care of, uh, uh, of an influx of orphans. Could you very briefly tell us uh, about Sister Briere and then we'll move on to my final question for you. Oh, briefly, Mother Briere, there's so much to talk about, but I think what she highlights is the role of women and the role that women played uh, in this drama that was unfolding in British North America in 1847, 1848. I mean, uh, the Sœur de Charité de Montréal actually sent Mother Briere and others to set up uh, in, in a sense, uh, a religious branch plant in Ottawa that would become the Grey Sisters in Ottawa. Uh, they were the ones who, who ran the hospital, they ran the fever sheds at Nepean Point, and they were the ones who were on the front lines. So I think what's often forgotten, okay, in this masculine world and in the patriarchy, which sometimes is the way in which history is written, is Mother Briere and other women who served on the front lines and sacrificed themselves. And as you well know, Jason, in Montreal, um, many of these uh, women religious died uh, in the act uh, uh, of charity, uh, just much akin to Bishop Power in Toronto. Thank you, Mark, and uh, excellent work keeping to time. And I'm gonna move on to my final question, which also covers the final section of the exhibit, Remembering Family Stories. It's a very vibrant section in which the descendants of famine Irish emigrants in, in, in Ontario recall their ancestors. They often share their family heirlooms. Uh, they often share the, the, the precious uh, objects that have been passed down through generations. But we're only going to look at one of these figures uh, uh, in this section, a woman named Brenda Sissons, who now lives in northern British Columbia, whose ancestor, Mary Conlon, very remarkably wrote a letter on board a ship called the Achilles as she was uh, sailing into, uh, into Grosile. It was a very uh, unfortunate moment for her as her brother had just fallen 
off, off the ship and drowned, and she herself would lose her life a few days later on Grosia, leaving only her daughter Margaret to uh, uh, alone in the New World. One of the remarkable artifacts we have in this exhibit is that letter reproduced and digitized, as well as a transcription of it. I'll just read the first few sentences as she writes on the Achilles. My dear brother, she's hoping to meet her brother in Toronto in a, in a few weeks time, it is with a sore heart I now address you, a widow with three small children, and likely before you receive this, I may give birth to another orphan. I do not know how to unfold my melancholy talk. About 10 o'clock on the 1st of May, my dear John went up to the head of the ship, a wave came up, which left my children fatherless. I am now destitute. A letter written on board ship in May of 1847. Mark, can you briefly tell us what happened to her daughter, Margaret Conlon, and how you traced, uh, how you traced her fate? Yeah, so Mar Margaret Conlon was the only one left out of a, uh, of a fairly large family. Um, and that family came from Armagh. Uh, the mother actually, Mary Conlon was from Tyrone. They were a Protestant family, which again, indicates that this famine, famine migration was not just a Catholic thing, it was also a Protestant uh, migration as well. And uh, we tracked her to the Protestant Orphan Home in Montreal, which was set, set up uh, under the auspices of uh, the Protestant Ladies of Montreal and under the care uh, of Bishop Mountain. So the Anglicans had their own uh, infrastructure that they began to build for particularly Protestant uh, orphan children. And it was this uncle who actually lived uh, in the uh, outside of Hamilton and linking with Laura here um, that uh, that basically bring comes to Montreal brings Margaret back uh, and and of course she thrives and we find this letter only because her descendants remember the story and I think the most important thing about this whole section of of this project is is the links historically uh, to the present making history relevant making a statement about how important public history is, and then having historians be able to see these artifacts, to interpret them. And I had a team, I've had five teams of senior undergraduate students work with me uh, to help uncover these stories, because I think it's important to stimulate in them this interest in research and the importance of linking past with present and making history alive to those generations. I mean, oftentimes I've heard Jason, you've heard it, Laura's heard it as, as a historian about, you know, oh, it was the worst subject I had in high school. It was so boring. I think this kind of site, okay, these kind of stories need to be told to ignite an interest in new generations as to what this Irish experience was. And it doesn't stop there, what the experience of any immigrant group was that, that comes to Canada. So, I mean, I, relevance is so important. And as we move into a post-pandemic world, we'll be able to continue the work fairly effectively, I think, Jason. And, and I'll be happy to toddle along, you know, as you, as you take your uh, dog and pony show uh, across the province of Ontario that hasn't been, you know, covered so far. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to all three of our panelists for some very uh, energetic performances. I'm about to hand the floor back to Charmaine uh, to take some questions, but before I do that, I want to plant a question of my own for Mark and uh, perhaps for you, uh, Robert and Laura as well, which is, uh, as, as you've pointed out, as, as everyone has pointed out, we're in the midst of a different pandemic. It's not typhus or ship fever in 1847, but we're living now in the world of COVID-19. And uh, I want you all to mull about this, as uh, mull over this as you're taking your, your other questions. You know, what, which of these stories, which of what aspects of your research gives you hope, gives you a sense of reassurance for dealing with our experiences now as you look back to the past? Something to mull over, because I am going to hand over the floor to Charmaine to to pose some other questions as well. Thank you to all three of you. Well, that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we did have some questions in the Q&A. Um, most of them were related to specific family members. So I think I was able to handle those, um, but uh, we didn't have any of a more general nature. So I think, I think you stimulated people to start thinking about how does my family fit into this particular history? Um, and, uh, that's what we want to do. We want people to start thinking about their history and uh, 
uh, making it come alive as you have tonight. And so I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us tonight. I know that um, some people have joined us late uh, in the discussion. Um, so I'd like to let you know that this um, discussion tonight has been recorded and we will post it on YouTube on the Foundation's YouTube channel. So those of you that um, came late to the discussion, um, you in a, in a couple of days, you'll be able to see the entire discussion on um, our YouTube channel. And I'm now going to ask uh, our technical uh, coordinator to put up a, a screenshot uh, giving you the URL of the virtual exhibit so you can explore it yourself. I don't see it. Well, I'll, uh, oh. oh, wait, I do have a new question that's just come in here and maybe someone can answer that first. Why isn't there more oral tradition about the famine in Irish Canadian and Irish American families? Anyone want to tackle that? Well, I might venture a comment on that. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I would stand corrected by you, Mark and Jason and Laura, but I think uh, very often in talking to Irish Canadians who have uh, an Irish connection, they would say, well, our family came before the famine or they came after the famine. And so then it would later transfer, you know, trans, uh, transcribe that they actually came during the famine. So to be famine Irish, uh, there was a stigma to it. And also that the, the trauma was so horrific, the journey was ghastly, and they witnessed terrible loss of life, uh, both at sea and upon arrival in Grosseil and in Montreal and in Toronto. I mean, it was just appalling hardship. And I think um, those who survived sort of bent into the wind and, and gritted their teeth and said, well, our focus is going to be on the future and on surviving to honor those who didn't make it. And um, I, I just think that there was a, there was a desire to, to thrive and prosper in a, in a new land and not to spend uh, an abundance of time reflecting upon the calamity of that summer, of that particular year. Now, that's just a personal view. And it's not rooted in perfect historical veracity, but I sense it from talking to people. And uh, so that would be my contribution to the question. Yeah, I think there, there, there's some truth to that in, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the way in which the story is told. But then again, you know, many of the migrants to Canada uh, were pre-famine migrants. Many of the famine migrants moved on. And actually what was interesting is they saw those who were pre-famine migrants, my own family, saw themselves through the lenses of the famine because it was such a traumatic event. I think one of the important things why the oral history wasn't done was that historians in, you know, in, the, in the past three generations just didn't think it was important. I mean, the important issues were the achievement of responsible government, uh, were the, the Whiggish uh, uh, politics of the day, the achievement of confederation, and of course, from colony to nation. Social history really doesn't become something that's pressing for academic uh, historians until about the late 1960s as part of that 60s revolution, and then into the 70s. And then other stories other than the stories of great white men you know, are, are, are going to be told. And so we have the advent of, of, of the history of immigration, of ethnicity, of women, uh, of, of class, of gender. And it's within that context that people start to get interested in the stories. And that's why I think Great Famine Voices is so important because, wow, we're trying to tap those stories that were never told publicly, but told internally. And, and now we're trying to collect those, you know, several generations, you know, beyond the original event. So I think, Robert, I mean, in, in many ways, it wasn't something that it, was, it wasn't talked about. But at the same time, historians weren't interested in listening to it. 
if I could uh, add something there, you will find those uh, oral histories passed down through generations in the Remembering Family Stories section in this exhibit. We talked briefly about Brenda Sissons, but she's actually quite typical of the figures in this section. Looking back on the hardships, looking back on the adversity that their female ancestors in particular faced and drawing strength from that in their present lives, paying homage to their ancestors, but also drawing strength from uh, uh, the resilience that their ancestors showed. So you, you do see in the, in the exhibit those stories that often are, are difficult to find elsewhere. I have one more question here and I think we'll wrap it up. I think this one will be answered fairly quickly. Is 1848 also considered a famine immigration year? Yes. <laughs> That's pretty quick. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is a famine immigration year, but at, at the results of 1847 are curious for Canada because Canada demands that, the, that the, the colonial office of the British government compensate them for the money that had been expended on, the, on fever sheds, hospitals, uh, the, the transportation that, that Laura has been working on and all of that. And the quid pro quo for that was, well, if, if we give you this money, it's a one-shot deal and you're going to have to take care of immigration from there on. This is a major turning point in the British government divesting responsibility and the Canadian government taking responsibility, which meant they raised port fees and per capita tax on, 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 on those immigrants coming in who were potentially ill, uh, sick and the like. And so what we see is a redirection then of migration to British North America. Uh, in, instead of landing in Quebec, they land in places like New York, Philadelphia, New Orleans and the like. And so from the 110,000 that, that, that set out in 1847 from, from British and Irish ports, you have, for Canada, you actually have something in the neighborhood of about 34 to 38,000 the next year. And the famine actually marks the high watermark of migration to British North America. And it's interesting as the United States begins to grow and it eclipses Canada and, uh, and keeps going and uh, it, uh, it becomes uh, uh, a much more preferable place for, for, for Irish migrants to go. Um, so there's a longer answer to the yes. <laughs> just, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all, all of you for your expertise. And I'm sure you've piqued everybody's interest now to go and explore the uh, website themselves. The exhibit is at www.irishfamonestories.ca. Uh, it's on your screen now. And uh, we also have a new web address for the new name of our foundation, www.canadairelandfoundation.com. And uh, you will find information there about our future events. The, for, the next event will be a very interesting discussion about Thomas Darcy McGee. Um, and that will be between Professor David Wilson, the biographer, uh, well-known biographer of McGee, and our own Toronto City Councilor, Joe Cressy, who happens to be a relative of Darcy McGee. So please tune in uh, Wednesday, April the 14th uh, for that, that conversation. And again, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.